it's especially important tonight that I begin by acknowledging that the land where I'm sitting right now is the unceded traditional territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, Musqueam, and Kwikwetlam peoples. These are people who are still around, and they are people who are survivors of a genocide. And I make a point of saying this because even though the process of genocide that we're going to learn about tonight, tonight. Professor Omar Bartov, happened far away from where I'm sitting now, the place where I am sitting right now is in fact a site of genocide. It's a site of trauma and displacement in the settler colonial process. And I really wish we were sitting all together tonight, face to face, in person, on unceded Coast Salish territory, learning about a faraway genocide while making connections as we're listening to a genocide that's much closer to home. But the upside to doing this as a live online webinar is that tonight's lecture is accessible to hundreds more people than it otherwise would have been. And so you might not be in British Columbia right now. You might be somewhere else in the world. And I urge you to take this opportunity to think about what you would say if you were acknowledging indigenous territory in the place where you're sitting right now. So if you're a settler in North America like I am, what research would you need to do to start to learn about the thousands of years of human history that predated your presence? What learning might you have to do to connect the insights of tonight's lecture to the traumas of settler colonialism in your home or in your hometown? So I did this today, uh, this exercise today for my hometown, Iowa City, Iowa. And I learned things about the Iowa, Sauk, and Meskwaki peoples that I'm ashamed to say I had no idea about that I never learned about in school as a kid growing up. I learned that the Meskwaki Nation in Iowa since the year 1867 through the present day has been buying land as privately pur purchased property to continue to enlarge and protect their sovereign nation. I didn't know that before and it didn't take me very long to figure it out and I urge you to give this kind of learning a try. It's not hard and it's not the end goal of reconciliation which involves much harder work but it's a necessary first step. If you're interested in tonight's lecture topic, you don't want to miss the second lecture in our series. It's coming up on Thursday, November 5th. It's featuring a survivor of genocide talking about her life and memories. I'll give you some more details at the very end of our event tonight. And so right now I'm going to virtually pass the microphone to my colleague, who is an award-winning teacher, a book author, a podcast host, and now Associate Dean of Graduate Studies at Simon Fraser University over to Dr. Roxanne Panchassi, who will introduce tonight's speakers for us. Thank you uh, so much, Jeremy, for that introduction. I am also coming at you from the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people here in close to downtown Vancouver. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, so I introduce people all the time. I've introduced one person today, in fact, in another Zoom uh, session. But this introduction tonight is a truly unprecedented and really profound uh, pleasure for me. In some ways, it's one I've been looking forward to for years. Of course, it's wonderful to be able to introduce Professor Omer Bartov, the John P. Birkeland Distinguished Professor of European History, and Professor of German Studies at Brown University. And I'm very excited to hear more about his latest work this evening. But I'm especially thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce this discussion between my colleague, Dr. Lauren Faulkner Rossi, who was many years ago an MA student right here, well, not here in this apartment, <laughs> but at SFU in history, and Professor Bartov, who was many years ago with a tiny bit of overlap between those two stories, uh, one of my PhD supervisors in history at Rutgers University. I have known Professor Bartov for about 27 years now. We first met when I was doing my coursework in the PhD program at Rutgers in the early 1990s, which seems like a zillion years ago. <laughs> he was my instructor for a graduate seminar in European history. His very popular undergraduate course, Road to the Holocaust, was the very first course that I ever TA for. Over the years, we have had many wonderful conversations, not so many in the past couple of decades because we've both been very busy. Um, conversations about politics, culture, history, and especially I have very fond recollections of conversations about the type of military history I didn't and did want to do. 
Um, Professor Bartov eventually became one of the supervisors of the doctoral dissertation that I was finishing up when I started my position here at SFU in the early 2000s. And that's when I met Lauren, <laughs> who was a graduate student looking to begin her own PhD program in European history. And the details of the story and how it all went down are a bit blurry to all of us, I think, at this point. But Lauren and I got to talking, and she ended up heading off to work with Professor Bartov, who had by then moved to Brown. And that doctoral work would lead Professor Rossi down her own research path in Holocaust studies to the Wehrmacht priests that are the subject of her first book, and eventually back here to SFU uh, to become one of my wonderful colleagues. So I wanted to tell this story because it's one that reveals the nature of academic connections across space and time. It's the kind of thing that is so important to all of us always, but especially now, I think, as we're all separated and socially distanced and doing this webinar uh, virtually instead of in person, which is what we'd hoped for originally. It's also a story that in thinking about how I wanted to tell it this evening has reminded me what an incredible teacher and role model Professor Bartov was for me as a student and was for Lauren as well. I, I know, I imagine, and I also know. I wouldn't be here, um, at least in part, if it wasn't for Omer's extraordinary intellectual and professional guidance and generosity. I'm gonna let Lauren situate his scholarship for all of you, but I wanted to get us started by situating him as a teacher, my teacher. A teacher I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to learn from again so many years later. Lauren? Thanks, Roxanne. That was, that was a really great intro. It brought back a lot of memories. Um, I'll start uh, by acknowledging that I am, am also on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Tsleil-Waututh, uh, Squamish, and Musqueam First Nations, uh, coming to you from North Vancouver. Um, introducing Omer is a privilege. He has held appointments at several universities in North America and in Israel. Between 1986 and 2019, if I'm going just by his CV, he authored or edited 27 books in multiple languages, which doesn't include the translations, two works of fiction, and chapters in books that run to several pages. He is currently working on at least three more projects, and another edited volume appeared in print this year which I'll say something more about in a minute. His list of invited lectures suggests that he spends as much time on planes as he does researching, writing, or teaching, or at least he did in the pre-pandemic era when boarding a flight was as easy as getting into a car. In short, Omer is a prolific, world-renowned scholar of modern European history and the history of the Holocaust, to name just two fields to which he has contributed. He is also an active and dedicated supervisor and mentor of graduate students, as Roxanne and I can both attest. I became determined to work with him after I read Mirrors of Destruction, a series of essays that he published in 2000 about the 20th century's darkest legacies, which he argues stemmed from the experience of the First World War. His breadth of knowledge on display in that book, his conviction, and the eloquence with which he relayed a complex narrative connecting seemingly disparate subjects struck me as the kind of history I wanted to write and the kind of historian, the critical storyteller that I wanted to be. I admired his seemingly effortless navigation of different historiographies and methodologies, a skill that he has continued to hone as he's moved beyond Europe into studies of Israel and even Asia. And as a practicing historian now myself, I can say with no exaggeration that this skill is a hard-won achievement that I may only ever aspire to have. So it was about 20 years ago that I began as his graduate student, and not coincidentally, when he was still in the early stages of researching what to me was a very little known area of Ukraine, where his mother's family had emigrated from in the mid-1930s. So in this sense, as long as I have known him, his determination to unearth the story of his mother's family and where they came from has constituted a large part of who I know him to be as a historian. This was a project that had significant scholarly value, emerging at a time when the field of German history was, to use his words, looking to the East, and he was indeed one of the pioneers of this. But it was at the same time intensely personal in a way that historians then and now in any field tend to avoid. He published some initial findings in the 2007 book Erased, 
vanishing traces of Jewish Galicia in present day Ukraine, but it was only in 2018 that the more comprehensive study appeared. Anatomy of, Gen of a Genocide, the life and death of a town called Buchach is several histories threaded together. First, it is the history of Buchach, a multi-ethnic town of Ukrainian, Polish, and Jewish populations that prior to the 20th century had passed between an independent Poland and Austria-Hungary. By 1921, it had fallen under Soviet control. Between 1941 and 1944, it experienced four changes in occupation between the Soviets and the Germans before it was finally liberated by the Red Army. At that point, an estimated one third of the district's pre-war population was gone, either murdered, deported, expelled, or fled. This included the vast majority of the 15,000 Jews that had lived there in 1941. It is a microhistory of inter-ethnic relations during a time of great political and social turmoil, concentrating on the genocidal period of World War II. But Omar has also included chapters on the pre 20th century history of the area and the inhabitants experience of volatility and violence during the First World War in the chaotic 1920s. So I could also call it an example of the long durée approach to history that emphasizes the significance of long term slowly changing structures. It is also what the Germans call Alltagsgeschichte, or an example of the history of daily life, albeit a daily life set during a time when total war and genocide were indistinguishable and pervasive. It is also a study of the politics of memory, its construction, transformation, and disintegration over several decades, shaped by top-down politics, as well as grassroots priorities and indifference. And finally, as a work that relies primarily on eyewitness testimony and oral history, it is an unparalleled example of how historians can incorporate a plurality of voices into a single narrative and showcase the value of these witnesses for, of historical events for our own understanding of the past. History as a discipline has only relatively recently, in the past decade or two, begun to take these kinds of eyewitnesses seriously and to treat their evidence as worthy of scrutiny and inclusion. The subfield of Holocaust history, which for so long insisted that eyewitnesses were subjective and therefore unreliable, has helped great break ground in this endeavor. Because of his extensive research for Anatomy of a Genocide, Omer has also edited a volume called Voices on War and Genocide, which came out this year. And this features three diaries, abridged and translated into English, that he used to reconstruct life in Buchach. Polish patriot Antoni Zivinsky, Ukrainian nationalist Viktor Patrykovich, and radio technician Masha Vizinger, one of the few Jews from Buchach to survive the Holocaust. Omer stakes his claim to the significance of eyewitness testimony in his introduction to this 2020 book, which also serves to explain why he is an ideal choice to launch our speaker series about witnesses to history. And I'm going to read a short quote before we'll get started on our conversation. He says in that book, first person narratives suffer from the limitations of subjectivity. They tell us how specific individuals saw and experienced the tiny segment of a historical event in which they played a role. But this is also their strength, since they draw us in and help us empathize with the historical actors in a manner that historical studies often fail to accomplish. These three men saw the same world and each other through different eyes, and readers may well have more sympathy with one view than with another. But the study of history is not simply an undertaking in establishing what happened or in taking sides as to who was right and who was wrong, who, tell the who tells the truth and who lies. It is ultimately about understanding human motivation, why people acted as they did at other times and under different circumstances. Thank you for being here, Omer. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, can, I, can I just say that I'm so delighted uh, First of all, that, that SFU is hosting me, um, and especially uh, to see you and Roxanne, uh, and to hear you speak so beautifully. I'm, I'm just enjoying myself uh, listening to this, and maybe we can stop here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, event over. <laughs> no, we have so much more to discuss, um, and, and I'm, as, I'm as excited as you are. I've been waiting for this for a long time as well, just as Roxanne said. Um, I'm wondering if I can ask you, by, by way of beginning, um, could you talk a little bit about why 
you wrote, Anatomy of a Genocide. I know you talk about it in the introduction, but I'd like to hear it from you as well. Yeah, it's, um, it's a complex story because as you were saying, um, I worked on the book on and off for 20 years and the last 10 years before the publication of the book were mostly dedicated to working on that. So even my own thinking evolved over time, but it began uh, with a question. And the question was about genocide, about the nature of genocide, um, which was just uh, now um, uh, mentioned by Jeremy, of course. Um, and the question was this, that when we think of the Holocaust, we often think of it as an event that even I used that term once uh, in a subtitle of a book of industrial killing, industrial murder. Uh, that is a kind of mechanical process whereby people are um, brought from uh, all corners of the continent, in that case of Europe, uh, by trains uh, into um, um, factories of death and within a very short period of time, uh, they are killed and disposed of and disappear. Um, and where there's very little contact between the victims and the perpetrators. So it's a bureaucratic, mechanical process that uh, endeavors to kill large numbers of people and limit the extent of exposure of those who are uh, perpetrating the genocide to what they're actually doing. Um, so my question was, was this really what the Holocaust was all about? And I started thinking about it in the 1990s, because in the 1990s, uh, following the fall of communism, um, there were two genocides, uh, one in Bosnia and one in Rwanda in 92 and in 94. And these genocides were very intimate genocides where people killed their own neighbors in very large numbers. And so I wanted to um, try and find what of that kind of genocide existed also in the Holocaust. Now, because the Holocaust was a huge event, because it spanned an entire continent, uh, there were hundreds of thousands of people engaged in the killing, in organizing the killing, and there were millions of people being killed. You couldn't really um, uh, examine it from the top without it becoming the kind of bureaucratic process as was seen by the perpetrators. If you wanted to see more the point of contact between victims and perpetrators, you needed to look in one spot. And that's why I chose a town. I wanted to see what happened in a single town. Was there this encounter between victims and perpetrators? Did people know each other before they started killing them? Um, and the town I chose, as you mentioned, uh, was the town of Buchach. And the reason I chose that town was that my mother came from it. And so initially, I just had to choose some town in Eastern Europe because that was where most Jews lived and where most Jews uh, were murdered. Uh, but once I made that choice, it changed the way I started carrying out that research because it happened to be the town that under different circumstances, I too might have been born in. It became something much more intimate. And so my own um, quest for understanding the intimacy of genocide became also an exercise in my own sense of intimacy with the place that my own family belonged to and most of my family was murdered in. Right. Um, and that, that's such an incredible part of the story and, and you do tell it in the introduction to your book. Um, in terms, you, you've mentioned sort of the limits of reading an event like genocide from the top down and what it's essential, obviously, that we have that part of the story. Um, but you, you, you make a very strong case using just the book that it's such an incomplete understanding of the complexities of the event, of, of, of the humanness, the human factor of the event, that these were literally people treating each other this way. So what do we see on the local level then? Um, that we don't see from the top? So, you know, the, the, the um, initial scholarship on the Holocaust for the first 20 years or so, and even the scholarship began quite late, it begins really in the late 50s and 60s and develops in the 70s and 80s. Most of it was from the top, 
and, and I found that as I sort of began training myself as a Holocaust historian rather than a German historian, which is what I was initially in a military historian, uh, what troubled me was that when um, these histories were written, they were written in, in a sense from the point of view of the perpetrators because the documents being used were the, were the documents of the perpetrators. Um, and because of that, the whole event appeared as one that had to be explained. You had to explain why uh, the Germans chose to kill the Jews. You had to explain how they went about doing it. What were their difficulties? It was a kind of bureaucratic history. And the, the, the victims were merely the byproduct of the whole thing. They didn't really play a role. Now, once you start looking from below, once you start looking at history from the bottom, then everything changes. It's not only that you see the victims, you also see the perpetrators on the, on the lowest level, you actually see the encounter. And beyond that, you realize, as I did when I started uh, studying Buchach, is that there are, of course, perpetrators, there are victims, they know each other, there are, there are intimate relations between them before the killing begins, but there are also other people there. Right. And those other people are the neighbors. And in the case of Buchach, they're Poles and Ukrainians. They are Christians, Poles, Roman Catholic Poles, Greek Catholic Ukrainians. And so you realize that the local genocide on the local level is a social event. And once you see it as a social event, a, a, a whole series of other things come up that you don't think about when you're looking at it from the point of view of Berlin. One thing that I think maybe is the most important to mention is that you realize that this set of distinctions that we created for ourselves, that in genocide you have three categories of people, you have perpetrators, you have victims, and you have bystanders, doesn't really work on the local level. On the local level, there are no bystanders. There are only degrees of engagement. Mm -hmm. There are people who collaborate, there are people who rescue. Most people are somewhere in between. There are people who profit from genocide. There are people who suffer from genocide. But everyone is engaged. Everybody see what is, sees what is happening. And it's not only at the time, but that the memories of that event, of the various groups, continue, persist through time beyond the event itself, in the case of the Holocaust, to this very day. So you see the social reality of a genocide, and in many ways, going far and going down also brings you closer. That is, you start to understand that any community under certain circumstances can actually descend to those sort of the, 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 the lowest parts of uh, humanity to the greatest horror. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's ultimately a social event. It's not something that you cannot describe as people said about the Holocaust. It's not ineffable. It is something that you can understand, you can see, and you can begin imagining it happening elsewhere in places where you would never, ever believe that it would happen. Um, th and that too is something that struck me as I was reading Anatomy of a Genocide was, was, was the involvement of literally everyone and and really that that category as you've just said of, of bystander doesn't exist when you look at it from that perspective i also appreciated that you located the the beginning of the disintegration of this um inter inter-ethnic or multi-ethnic coexistence um before world war one right this is not something that happens overnight it's not an ideology of hatred that's imported from somewhere else that sort of catches fire and spreads easily. Um, this was something that was was homegrown or ingrown um, for decades, if, if not longer, um, before the the, the social event, genocide is social event unfolded, um, which changes the way that I too now approach genocides, um, regardless of time or space. You, you sort of have to look at the longer underlying factors that have fed into it and not at the immediate causes necessarily to really understand what's going on. Um, of course, one of the other remarkable things about this text, uh, and one of the reasons I teach it to my students, and one of the first things they comment on, is your use of first-person accounts. 
and, and how shared, how spread out they are through this community. So the Germans are obviously there, are, are, are obviously the instigators of genocide, but, but as you've already said, um, the collaborators and the actual perpetrators carrying out some of these horrific deeds are Ukrainians and Poles. Um, you have some, some ex what must have been extraordinarily difficult passages to write of, of Jews facing horrible choices within families, with friends. Um, so I want to ask some questions about how, as a historian, you approach first-person accounts and eyewitness uh, testimony. What were, um, what were some of the difficulties using, you encountered using so much of this kind of evidence? So let me, be, before I answer that, let me just say, uh, uh, sort of refer to something you said earlier, because I think it's also very important. Uh, we, we tend to think of genocide as something that happens out of the blue. It's something, it's some horrific event that happens maybe because a foreign power invades and has the intention of carrying it, it out and um, uh, attacks an innocent a population and begins killing them. Um, what we forget is that genocide um, has much earlier beginnings. Those beginnings don't necessarily mean that genocide will occur, right. but they are signs of a growing potential of this kind of fraternal violence. And in the case that I studied, one has to say that the most, the clearest um, trigger to what later becomes genocide is the rise of, of ethno-nationalism, territorial ethno-nationalism in that area. Now, nationalism does not always lead to genocide, of course, but that kind of, 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 of nationalism in areas which were multi-ethnic, where different ethnic religious groups had lived side by side for at least four centuries. That changes, begins changing the relations between these groups and the stories that each group tells itself about how it got there, what it is, who are its neighbors, become stories that are increasingly antagonistic. And it becomes much more a story of who belongs there and who doesn't, who has to be kicked out and who has to be eradicated. And so that's very important to understand. And the second really important element in understanding genocide, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about Rwanda, we're talking about Cambodia, we're talking about the Armenians, we're talking about Bosnia, is that a certain population is um, increasingly described as different from us, as having lesser human qualities, as being in a sense not part of the solidarity of humanity. And once you start describing populations that way, the potential of genocide arises and can then be used, manipulated, exploited by those who have other political goals. So this is something very important now. Um, to see that from the top, as I was talking about it now, is a kind of explanation, right? It's an interpretation. When you look at it from the bottom, when you listen to the stories, when you hear how it is told, that's, that's much more difficult for us, I think, as human beings, certainly it was for me, to come to terms with. Because in many of the stories that you hear, these first-person accounts, the first um, response of people is, how could my neighbor have done that to us? When you hear of people saying, this man's daughter and I had studied together in their kitchen, and then one day he came with an ax and killed my family. That is something that's really very, very hard for us to fathom. And we, we think about it as, as, as just having happened. And of course, there is a process that brings that. There's, there's waves, there's a sort of depth of resentment that builds up of jealousy, of, of anger, of rage. Uh, but when you see it as reported by individuals through eyewitness reports, uh, that changes, I believe, your whole understanding of what the bigger event is, because that is the core of it. The core of it is that people who had lived together start killing each other, and they know each other by name, they had lived together, they had traded together, they had eaten together, and now suddenly it all breaks down, this entire social fabric breaks down.
Now, obviously there were moments for me that were particularly difficult. Um, you know, when I was doing uh, this research, uh, my daughter was then uh, a child. She was, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I did it for quite a few years, mm -hmm. and I was reading these testimonies. And many of the testimonies that I had were testimonies by women who, at the time, were children of that age. And I, I, I had moments that I simply could not read or listen because many also were audio taped or videotaped testimonies. Uh, because when you think about it, when you personalize that, you're not only hearing a woman in her 40s or 50s or 60s recalling what happened to her as a child. You have a child at home. Yeah. And, you, and you cannot imagine that your own child would have been in that situation. It's simply unthinkable. And yet this is what happened. There were quite a number of women who were the same age that my mother was when this happened. But uh, women who were born like my mother was in 1924. She had left to Palestine in 1935, so she was not there. But had they not left, had they stayed for another four years, she would have been there. And that too, was it, that is the kind of intimacy that you have not only from reading these often horrifying reports, but also from thinking how close it possibly is to you, to those you love. Uh, and I think that that creates a different, a different understanding, an understanding that has to do with empathy and not only with the mind. Um, I, I would, uh, I will admit that I, I appreciate how much your book resensitized me to this period of history as, as a, as a scholar who deals with it fairly regularly and as a, an instructor who teaches about it every year, my students actually ask me how I do it. And the only way you can, I think, is to desensitize yourself and, and try to take a distance. Um, and when you get as good at it as one does to have to teach it as often as I do, um, it, it's, it sort of becomes a, a shell and you get very numb. And your, your book very effectively broke through that in, I think, a very important and necessary way, largely because you used so much testimony from children. And I read it at a time when I, too, had a young daughter at home, and it was impossible not to read that and think, my God, what would I do if, if this happened to our family, if my daughter was, was in these horrific situations herself? And that really does bring bring home the event as, as something that is not other that is that is um, th that could affect any of us if we found ourselves living in these circumstances. Um, that, that sort of leads me to ask how if you could talk a little bit about how your link to uh, your personal link to this event in this particular site of Buchach uh, affects the writing of a historical event in ways that maybe it didn't affect other histories that you've written other books. Um, yes, so, you know, it was, uh, as I said, uh, initially, this was almost, or at least that's the story I told myself. Uh, it was happenstance. I, I needed a town. Mm -hmm. I knew my mother came from that town. Uh, and I thought, okay, I, I don't know much about my mother's town. I might as well look into that town. I also actually knew something about it because there's a very famous author who came from that town. Uh, Shmuel Yosef Agnon was the only Hebrew language author to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1966, a year in which I actually also met him. Um, and I greatly admired his writing. I studied it in high school and I, I, I still read him with, with great admiration. So I knew something about it. Uh, but there was a moment, uh, which I mentioned briefly in the book, that in 1995, uh, since I thought I might choose this town to be my, my, my sort of local, my, my, my test case, uh, that I decided to interview my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a very a, important moment for me on a whole set of respects. It, it, it wasn't only one thing. I was then 41 years old, and my mother was 71, and I just came into her kitchen and I said, um, and, and I brought a tape recorder, which is what we used at the time. And I pressed the button and I said, uh, can you tell me about your childhood? And she was making chicken soup. And she spoke for 90 minutes, basically with very few questions from me. 
And subsequently, I, I thought about it that I'd never answer that question. Um, and now there were reasons why I never asked her that question. I was growing up in Israel. In Israel, we were not supposed to ask about where we came from. We were only supposed to look forward. I was the first generation of um, um, people born in the state of Israel. Um, and my mother had reasons also not to talk about it because she had made a decision when she came to Palestine as an 11 year old to just break off that past and to remake herself because she had lost the world that she came from. Uh, so there, were, there was a context to that. But when she spoke about her childhood, she spoke about it not as a place where there was a Holocaust, because she left before the Holocaust. She spoke about it um, very fondly, as a nice, beautiful childhood that you realize while she was speaking that she missed. And that for the first time, she was sort of evoking these memories, speaking to her son about it. And so that made me think that there was something wrong in the very uh, initial way that I had constructed my research. Uh, that is that the question really was not only about the encounter between the victims and the perpetrators. It was what was that community? How did people live there? What was the, the, the nature of the relations between the different groups and how did it change over time so that by the time the Germans marched in, in July 1941, something was there already in the air that my mother as a small child did not know, but was already there. So it became something different. It wasn't only a story of what happened during the genocide, which is the second part of the book, but how did we get there and how did people live in such places uh, before all of that? And of course, Buchach was just one case. There were hundreds and hundreds of towns like that throughout Eastern Europe. And we should say that about half of the victims of the Holocaust, the Jewish victims of the Holocaust, uh, did not die in extermination camps, but largely died in those kind of towns right there where they lived. Um, a, a sobering, uh, a sobering fact that uh, is, gets is getting increasing attention, I think, from from scholars and teachers. Can I ask you how difficult was it to find sources to tell this kind of story, particularly the, the pre nineteen forty one story of of Buchach, given given how how um, earnest the attempt has been since nineteen forty five to erase a big part of that history. Uh, you, you know, so initially I thought, well, how much material is there going to be on one little town in Eastern Europe that had at its height about 15,000 in inhabitants, um, and now has even less, actually, uh, even fewer. Um, well, it turns out that if you try to do what I was trying to do, which was a kind of total history of one little place, uh, then you can find a lot. I, I had some excellent research assistants too, I have to say, some people who did amazing work. Um, I found materials, I or my research assistants, in over 50 archives. Wow. Uh, I have an entire archive actually around this room and parts of the room that I'm sitting in uh, that took me years to go through. So because this town had been first uh, under Polish rule until 1772, then under Austrian rule, which produced a lot of documents, this was uh, the Habsburg Empire loved documents, uh, then uh, under Polish rule in the interwar period when there was a lot of documentation and uh, a lot of statistical data and so forth. And then of course, uh, during Soviet and German occupation, there were many, many documents. Uh, but there was a, a one issue. I really wanted to tell the story through the voices of the people who were there. Yeah. I didn't just want to tell a kind of social bureaucratic history. <clears throat> I was really interested in that and I didn't think the readers would be interested. Uh, I wanted to tell it through the voices of those who had lived there yeah. and to let them speak as much as I could. The voices um, become more and more numerous the closer you come to the modern period, of course, because then they were recorded. So the, the bulk of voices that I had were from the 30s and the 40s. Uh, 
before that, I had to use diaries, I had to use travel accounts. I used as many as I could, but it was not as numerous. So in that sense, the nature of the book depended also on the nature of the sources. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, and and it's, it's, it's a book that I love teaching partly for that reason, be, because of the emphasis on eyewitness testimony and, and oral testimony, but the, the, the breadth of this of the source type as well, just to show my students um, how one can can do this. Um, did you find uh, when you were using oral testimony in particular, you've mentioned that you did um, did use oral testimony. Did you find that there were particular challenges using that kind of testimony as opposed to relying on written sources in your in the course of your research? Well, so uh, and, you know, it depends how you define it. There are problems with all of them. So um, you can have, um, I use diaries. Diaries are the closest to the period, right? People are writing while this is happening. And so they don't even know what's going to happen next, right? Uh, so that's one particular kind of, of first person uh, testimony, right? Or first person uh, history, right? Then you have um, um, testimonies, and those testimonies, some were given very early, even before the war ended, in between 44 and 47. Some were given much later, uh, 40, 50 years later, into the, the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century. Then you have uh, courtroom testimonies, uh, people you know, giving evidence in a, in, in a judicial setting. And then you have memoirs. Uh, and, and often, well, at times you have people who have given more than one testimony. They may have uh, given one testimony in the, in the immediate aftermath of the war, then they gave one 40 years later, they may have testified in a court. And so you can sort of see how their story changes. So they're different. But there are, of course, you know, um, first person histories uh, or accounts are subjective. People say what they remember. They say uh, where they were. Uh, th th there are problems with such accounts, of course. Um, and historians have pointed that out. My approach to that was not to trust everything that people said, of course, but was to have a critical mass of all the documentation I could have. This is why I said a kind of total history of a very small place. So if you have several testimonies about the same events. Uh, you can see patterns. If you have testimonies given by Ukrainians, by Poles, by Jews, by Germans, you have official documents of what happened at the time, then you can create a sort of three-dimensional picture of what mm -hmm. happened. You have a kind of Rashomon effect, you know, the different people are saying yeah. remember different things but you can use it to create a three-dimensional picture of the event. Uh, and of course I wanted to reconstruct the truth because I'm an historian and I was trained as an empirical historian, but I also was interested in the truth of the people, what they believed happened to them. And even if I could say, well, maybe that's not exactly what happened, the way they saw things at the time and the way they remembered it was also important for me in reconstructing the story. Uh, so in that sense, it is an attempt to combine uh, individual voices, numerous voices. I'm talking about 250 or so Jewish voices, about 50 Polish voices, about 30 Ukrainian voices. Now, the last thing I'll say is, you said oral history is interviews. Now, when you yourself are speaking with a person, there's a whole other dynamic. Uh, most of that was not me speaking with other people, but in some cases I did. In some cases I spoke with people who had also testified before. And that creates a whole other dynamic that also has to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's, a, that's a very good point. And I, I appreciate your reference to the, the truth, um, something that, of course, empirical historians are always con uh, concerned with. Um, in, in speaking with Holocaust survivors here in Vancouver, the ones who have started thinking seriously about memoirs and writing memoirs have, have been careful to say, my truth, which might be different from 
the truth or the historical truth. So, so I'm going to have great fun exploring that with my students to see if, if they can square that circle, so to speak. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about empathy. Um, in, in the introduction to Voices on War and Genocide, which is the edited volume with, with the three diaries, which are, are just fascinating, you mentioned acquiring an empathy with the diary writers through gaining an intimate knowledge of their opinions, prejudices, hopes, and disillusionments. Can you comment on how important you think empathy is in the writing of history, and if there's a risk uh, of acquiring too much empathy, particularly in a field like Holocaust studies or genocide studies? So, you know, first of all, I don't think that you can write uh, good history without empathy. That's, um, and, and, and that's not only me saying that, that's Leopold von Ranke was the sort of father of uh, the modern historical discipline who spoke about the need in German for Einfühlen, for feeling yourself into uh, the history that you're writing, which is empathy. Yeah. Uh, now, empathy does not mean sympathy. Uh, you, you don't have to like the people you empathize with. Empathy is to try and see the world through their eyes. You may not want to see the world through their eyes. It may not be a pretty world, but if you want to understand what they do, and as I said, if you want to understand their motivation, why they do what they do, and they're all protagonists in history. You study them because they do things in history. History doesn't only happen to them. They are making it happen. You have to try and see the world through their eyes. So I, I started thinking that not when I was writing about Buchach. I started this, as, as you know, Lauren, uh, studying the German army. And I was then a graduate student. And I, I used to say that I have a, a several thousand uh, dead, frozen German soldiers in my, in my cupboard. Uh, and I had to empathize with them because I wanted to understand their experiences in the war. Many of them carried out pretty bad things. Mm -hmm. Many of them were involved in, in horrible war crimes. Uh, but I had to understand them through their eyes and I had to put myself there. I was then young. I had also been a soldier, so I could sort of also imagine myself into their own situation. So empathy is crucial, but it does not mean sympathy. And the second thing that is important, which is almost the opposite, I would say, is that I do believe in using judgment in history. I don't believe in that kind of objectivity where you only look from the side and describe things, but you make no judgments. I do think you can make judgments. But when you look at events like what happened in Buchach and in so many hundreds of other places, you realize how difficult it is. You realize that the decisions people made on a day-to-day -day basis, the choices they made were so difficult. They never knew whether they made the right choice or not. And at times, and in, 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 in times of extreme violence, the choice you make is a choice of life and death, and there is no more difficult choice than that. And so while I believe that we can judge, we can say that there are people who were perpetrators, they were murderers, and there's no reason to pity them. We can try to understand why they acted the way they did, but we, there's no reason for sympathy with them. Mm -hmm. We also have to understand that in those periods, our judgment, has to be very, very well informed in order to matter because it, these were such different times where every choice was really a choice of life and death. Um, thank you for that. I, I, uh, before I came to you as a graduate student, I had read a lot of Hannah Arendt and she rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. She had very firm opinions, but that was something that has stuck with me. Um, she insisted that the historian's primary responsibility was to judge. Um, and I kept running into scholars that didn't like that or didn't agree with it, but I was, I was very happy to find in my, in my doctoral advisor, somebody who understood uh, the sentiment behind that expression. So um, I, I have more questions that I uh, want to work through, but I'm also conscious that many, uh, many people have tuned in as part of our audience, and I want to give them an opportunity to raise questions as well. So I'll put mine on reserve and open the floor 
to, um, to questions from our audience. Um, Roxanne, do you want to read the yeah. questions? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm back. <laughs> Uh, so we have a number of questions, uh, and I'm just going to, I think, roughly ask them and pose them in the order that they're appearing. So our first question is from a uh, graduate student at SFU, uh, Leah Wiener, um, who asks, uh, or who says, I'm curious about how a childhood in Bukach uh, would have compared to other towns in the area in terms of pogroms earlier in the century. My own family left Jorge. Am I saying that right? Um, now in Moldova, following the Kishinev pogrom, how much anti-Semitism was your mother aware of in her early childhood? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question because uh, as I said, when I was uh, interviewing my mother, what struck me was that she wasn't describing any, any violence there. Uh, she was aware of anti-Semitism. She has a story about the, regarding uh, Buchach, uh, but by and large, in, let me put it that way. First of all, in Buchach itself, uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, Buchach under Polish rule, uh, there was not much anti-Jewish violence. There was growing anti-Semitism. Uh, there was growing official anti-Semitism by the Polish state, and there was growing local anti-Semitism, particularly by Ukrainian insurgents who saw the Jews as collaborating with the Poles who were oppressing the Ukrainians. Um, now, it's, it's interesting because children, uh, in, in young children in places like Buchach, uh, play together. Most of my mother's um, playmates were Poles and Ukrainians, more Ukrainians than Poles. But she left when she was 11. And it was around that age their children started being separated according to their ethnic roots. And by the time the people that she played with were a little bit older, in 1939, 1940, 1941, then they were already largely separated into their ethnic groups. So th that tells you something also about um, how when you hear stories of a childhood, they tell you about the childhood. They don't necessarily tell you about how things will develop later on. Now, the, the questioner uh, makes a good point. It depends in Eastern Europe where you were. There was a great deal of anti-Jewish violence in the other side of Ukraine. This is West Ukraine. Now this area is West Ukraine, then it was East Galicia. If you were in the area that uh, was east of there, between 1917 and 1919, there, were vast, uh, there was vast violence against Jews. Between 50 and 100,000 Jews were killed in riots, in pogroms by um, uh, Ukrainian nationalists and by Red Army units, by Cossack Red Cavalry. Uh, but that was on the other side. That was on the Russian side, not on what became the Polish side. Uh, and, the, and the final point I would make, which is important, and, and Lauren sort of referred to it, and we didn't develop that, is the great importance of World War I. Now, World War I is important to understand the Holocaust as well in the West, but World War I in Eastern Europe, uh, in those areas that were occupied by the Russian army, was an area of tremendous violence. There was violence between all the ethnic groups, but there was particular violence against Jews. And that was the first time that these populations saw that there was a group of people uh, against whom there was license to exercise violence. And that certainly changed people's minds. What until then had been a thought had been prejudiced is translated into actual violence. And so I would say that in the long run, if you want to understand what happens in 39, it's not good enough to go back to the 1930s. You actually have to go back to events in World War I. Um, so we, have another, uh, we have another question from um, Catherine Santarno, who's an undergraduate at SFU in history. Um, 
how did you decide which testimonies to include in the work? That's also a very good question. It's it's almost it's it's very hard to decide um, because I had to eliminate people, and then not only did I have to decide which testimonies to use, I had to decide what to use of these testimonies. Um, uh, Laura knows that in the in in the book that I just published, I actually say that because I had to uh, cut those testimonies I used. Uh, pretty short because otherwise the book would be too big. Um, I was happy to be able to publish three lengthy diaries because once you read a lengthy diary, it's not only somebody telling you about an event, it's somebody who becomes alive on the page. You actually see an entire lifespan. You see their families, you see their relations. Uh, so even after selecting those testimonies I selected, I also had to cut them uh, much more than I wanted to. But how did I select them? Um, one decision I made, there's a, one chapter in the book, uh, The Daily Life of Genocide, which is largely based on testimonies of Jews. I, I had to make a decision, and the decision I made was to use testimonies that had an element there also of rescue that were not entirely dark. That is that they were about cases in which people uh, under very diff difficult circumstances uh, also saw the goodness of other people. Uh, and to me that was crucial because obviously most of the people uh, who were targeted for genocide were murdered, the vast majority of them. But most of the people who survived, survived because somebody helped them. And usually it was more than one person. It was several people. Now they were betrayed as well, they, and they were very bitter about that, but they were helped. And to me, it was important to show this sort of, uh, the, the rays of light, the sort of shards of light in a period that was largely very dark, in a sense, because I wanted to show that there was choice. And testimonies that show, that show that people made a choice at a certain point, I thought were important because they do tell us something about that part of history and maybe also about ourselves. Um, so we have a question from uh, Sandra Capodoni. Um, could you talk about your sense of the difference between first person accounts through testimonies or diaries and personal stories published as memoirs, but with literary qualities, such as Primo Levi's account in If This Is a Man. Well, there, there is a big difference, um, but I would also say that um, Primo Levi's uh, particular uh, uh, Is This a Man is, uh, is, is itself a unique example. Uh, so it shouldn't stand for all the memoirs uh, uh, because of what he was trying to do in that book. Uh, but there is, as already indicated in the question itself, there is a big difference. Uh, it, some would argue that the closer the testimony is to the time of the event, uh, the more it tells you about the nature of the event. So if you have a diary or if you have a testimony that was collected right after in 1944, uh, it's more authentic, it's, it's closer to the event, the memories are fresher. And I think to some extent it's true, but I don't think it's entirely true. So that even in testimonies, which are not fictionalized and are not written as a memoir, but simply given say 40 years later, uh, you may actually find uh, that they can be more telling, that they can be uh, more introspective than a testimony given right at the time or written or a diary. Uh, one example would be, which, uh, which I know of specifically, particularly of young girls, as Lauren said, I, I, I wrote about quite a number of children, young girls who were sexually abused, of which there were many, uh, when they gave early testimonies, they often didn't even mention it, or they mentioned it in a very indirect way. And when they became grown women, often they had their own families already, they had had a life, 
they could actually talk about that more openly. So that's just within testimonies themselves. Once you um, write a memoir, then you're already trying to do something else, right? You're actually using a sort of aesthetic. You are trying to tell a tale. And in, in your mind, I think often there is a sort of moral that you want to pass on. And you're also using examples of other memoirs that you've read. So you are putting things in a certain form. Now that is not to say that memoirs are not useful. They can be very useful, but they are a different genre. Uh, and especially if they're well written. I've, I've read a number of memoirs that are not particularly well written. Uh, so they are actually closer to a testimony. Uh, they're just this happened and then this happened. Uh, whereas in a memoir, you try to tell a story, and once you do that, then its evidentiary value may diminish. And Levy is different because Levy actually wanted to tell the story of his understanding of the event in Auschwitz, and I'd say the heart of it is actually what I talked about earlier, it's the encounter between the perpetrator and the victim. It's the, it, the, the heart of it is seeking the, your own humanity. It's trying to hold on to that fragment of humanity that remains of you even in the camp. Uh, and his survival is really dependent on that as he portrays it there. Um, Omer, I'm going to ask you sort of a double questions from the same person, but they are both connected to testimony. So the first is from a student, uh, Tali Radke, who's, um, who asks, how do you approach the historical rhetoric that devalues oral or eyewitness testimony um, as subjective and thus vulnerable to inaccuracy? So how would you answer that type of thing or that type of charge critique with uh, your experience? And then the other question is um, from my colleague, uh, William Keogh, and also around this question of doing oral history and testimonies that, you know, trying to do oral history on such a difficult subject must have created the potential to re-traumatize people, perpetrators, victims, bystanders, and others. So do, is that something that you struggled with uh, in moving forward with the project? So maybe those two questions. So the first question, um, I don't write about it in the book because in the book I, I sort of tell the story. Uh, but before I published the book, I wrote a long article that actually speaks exactly about that. I uh, reject that opinion uh, that we cannot use uh, testimonies because they uh, are subjective, uh, because the opposite of that is that we have objective documents, right? Uh, and what are the objective documents produced in genocides? Who produces objective documents in genocide? It's the perpetrators, because victims don't have time to collect archives, to write reports, they're, they're trying to survive. So the people who produce these so-called objective documents say in the Holocaust are the Gestapo, the SS. Uh, if we think that those are objective and those of the victims are subjective, then we are writing a very strange kind of history. We really are writing a history through the prison, through the eyes of the perpetrators. And while I believe in empathy, I don't believe in being fooled by uh, the perpetrators who wrote these documents. You also are not writing good history because history cannot be written only from one, one perspective, any history, not only the history of the Holocaust, but the history say, of a revolution. If you write a history of a revolution only from the point of view of the revolutionaries. Um, there's a whole other aspect to it, quite apart from the experiential one, that if you want to know about the event, you want to know also how it was experienced, not only how it was organized. There's also the fact that many um, elements in genocide entirely disappear from history if you don't listen to the victims uh, because the perpetrators were not interested in them. They didn't document them. And so they vanished from history. And the last thing I would say is that in the Holocaust, but not only in the Holocaust, survivors of genocide who report on what happened to them 
report that to historians. That is, they want historians to tell their story. And historians, in the case, in the, in the early years of Holocaust um, historiography, with some exceptions, betrayed them. They just didn't use them. They just said, well, you know, you have your stories to tell, but we are writing history with a capital H. And so I, I entirely reject that both in terms of writing a good history and in terms of the moral aspect of writing history, of leaving the, the victims out, which, which to me is, is unacceptable. Um, the second question, um, um, it, it, it is true. Um, the, maybe the best example of that is actually the film uh, made by Claude Lanzmann, uh, Shoah, uh, who's, who said himself that he uh, kept the, only those interviews in which he brought the interviewee, who were survivors mostly, to the point that they broke down. He, he actually re-traumatized them because he wanted to have that on film. Um, it's an extraordinary film, but that is, it, it's, it's precisely correct that that is the sort of, the, 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 the main predicament of, of that film, the main problem in that film. Um, I, I didn't have that many uh, such cases because by the time I was doing that, there were not that many people that I could interview, but there were some. And in some cases, I'd say very few, it happened that people broke down while they were talking with me. And that was very hard. That was very hard for me and very hard for them. And, and, and it made me question myself. Um, but they wanted to talk. And what happened to me over and over again was that people who spoke with me were thanking me, which made me very uncomfortable. And they said, we want you to tell our story. Finally, somebody will tell our story. And my main guilty conscience has to do with the fact that by the time I finished all of this, most of them had passed away already. Uh, so in that sense, I, I do believe that at least the people that I spoke with really wanted their stories to be told, even though it was very painful for them to tell them. Can I just hop on to that, Roxanne, before you move on? Um, that's been my experience as well, much, much more limited than, than Omer's, but the, the Holocaust survivors that I've been working with, and one in particular um, is a child survivor, and my questions have brought back some very painful memories that she hasn't thought about in literally 75 years. Um, and, and so that's really affected me too, but she's always been very quick to say, I want to do this, I'm invested in this, I, I, I was expecting this to not be easy, um, and I can see where we're going, and so it's worth it. So I've sort of let her be my guide just in terms of, of how far to go with, with re-traumatizing, um, with, with asking questions that I know are going to, are, are going to be hard for her to answer. Um, it's it, not easy, and I and I like Omar. I, I question myself some nights. Is this really necessary? But it's her determination to to have her voice heard really that that keeps me going. So I'm so wrapped. <laughs> what you were saying, I forgot to look at the next question. Okay, so um, uh, I have another question that kind of follows up on talking about writing the the book, Omar, from um, my colleague Aaron. Wendell, who um, says, I'm so grateful for this wonderful talk. I'm wondering about some of the considerations that came up while you were actually writing the book. So beyond that research stage, um, at the point of actually sitting down and writing it, what choices did you make? What were some of the things that you were concerned about as you sought, as you sought to structure the narrative and to implot the, the histories in the book? This is taking me back to graduate school too. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there were so many that I, I, I will have to choose because obviously I had a lot of dilemmas in how to do it and the book was structured quite differently when I envisioned it. Uh, and I'll say I made one major decision. Uh, there were many, but I made one major decision. Uh, this book originally had 12 chapters. Uh, and each chapter at one point or another was several hundred pages long. I mean, that's, that's part of why it took so long. 
Uh, and I started cutting them and cutting them. And at some point I realized that I really had two books. Uh, that one book was the history of the place in the borderlands um, and um, how people came to it, how they were transformed in that place, and then where do they go from it? What became of them? That was one story, and I was fascinated by that story. And it took me to periods that I did not know much about, and I had to study, you know, early modern history and uh, early Jewish history and Polish history and Ukrainian history, and it was fascinating. And, uh, and it took me a few years. And then I realized, but that's not the other book. The other book was really um, an anatomy of a genocide, was the roots of genocide in one place. Where does it begin? And then how does it happen? So a sort of long durée sort of thing that um, where does it begin? How, how far back can you, can you uh, take it? And then when it happens, a very close microscopic look at the events. And so I made a decision to do only the second book. And I dumped all those earlier chapters. And it really was hard because I love those chapters. And my wife, who is a scholar of literature, liked them even more. And she was pretty disappointed with me for dropping those chapters. Um, now I feel better because I wrote that other book. I just finished it. Uh, so there is a second book, uh, but it is a different book. And I'm glad that I separated them because you could not put it together. Uh, so this was a big decision. It really was very hard. Uh, I also have to admit that I had a very, very good editor. I, I've, I've never worked with an editor like this before. This was a, a, a relatively young fellow in his, in his 30s and an aspiring writer. He, he published a memoir himself. And he really helped me because when you're so engaged in something like that, with all these voices, this cacophony of voices that you've lived for years with, it's very hard, as we said before, like, what do you use? Which testimony do you use? How much do you give of it? I had to make very difficult decisions on that. Uh, but th that's, that's part, you know, selection is almost everything in writing history, like in making movies. Um. We have a question from Adam Miziel. Um, Professor Bartok, have you had any feedback from Bukash and Ukraine on how your book has been received there? And how were you received in the town during your visits there and while you were doing your research? Adam, hello, Adam. Adam Musha is, is my Polish translator. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm so glad that, it, that he's here. I apologize for mispronouncing your name, Adam. <laughs> no, but that's uh, I'm I'm. He, he, this was a wonderful translation, and 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 he got me to work really hard on the book again when it was being translated, and to look up all these documents in Polish and Ukrainian and Russian and German, uh, all of which he can read. Um, um, uh, responses. I I have not had responses from Ukraine that I know of at least, not from now. I mean, I've heard from some people, but I don't know of any uh, formal responses. Uh, I have had interest from Poland. I was supposed to go there and give a talk, but um, COVID-19 uh, stepped in. So I was supposed to be there, I think in May uh, to speak. Uh, I haven't seen, maybe Adam has, I have not seen reviews in Poland. Uh, so my perspective is limited to the stories that I know, uh, and there has been a great deal of interest among Polish historians, students of Polish history, students of Polish Jewish history. Um, my book from that point of view is part obviously of a larger enterprise that is very much happening in Poland of these kind of local histories and looking also at the Holocaust from below. Uh, I, I myself was very influenced by a Polish historian. He's actually, he was trained as a sociologist, I think. Um, 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 uh, Jan Gross, Jan Tomasz Gross. Uh, Jan Grabowski is another Polish historian who's been doing very important work sort of at the lower level. Um, but I'm still waiting for some more um, responses from Poland, I would say. Mm 
the book is coming out in German, I think, uh, very soon in the coming months, and I'd be very curious to get responses from Germany too, because it's of, obviously there are parts there that speak a great deal about the German perpetrators as well that we didn't speak about here. Adam has added that there have been very positive reviews of your book in Poland. Adam, send them to me. Thank you. <laughs> this is great to facilitate this conversation between you and your translator. I'm lucky it's not happening. I, I was absorbed in the, in the next book, so I wasn't actually following up so much. I immediately delved into what I had uh, dumped in the first one. So. <laughs> Um, okay, just let's see. I'm just kind of scrolling through here. Um, there's a question from my colleague uh, and chair of the Department of History, uh, Hilmar Pavel. How would you classify the documents in the Oneg Chavez archives organized by uh, Emmanuel Mingelblum meant to tell the story of the Warsaw Ghetto memoirs, testimonies, other? How would you? Well, you know, I, I was actually. Um, just talking about the, the other day, because there's a kind of similarity uh, in what um, Immanuel Ringeblum, who was the organizer of the archive and who came from Buchach, uh, um, really tried to do. Um, the, and, and of course, now there's a very important book on this uh, um, by, by, by Sam Castle. Um, in, in some ways, what uh, the Onik Shabbos or Onik Shabbat archive was trying to do uh, resembles what I was trying to do, only they were doing it under very, very, very different circumstances, of course, because they were collecting all these documents in real time, uh, not knowing that eventually the ghetto would be entirely destroyed and erased. Uh, but what they were trying to do was to collect as much as they could, uh, all kinds of materials, uh, all kinds of first person testimonies, but also uh, studies of uh, the, for instance, the, the effect of hunger, of uh, uh, epidemics. Uh, so they were trying to do a kind of total history of the ghetto. And we are very fortunate that two thirds of this material survives because without that, we would not be able to have such a, the ability to reconstruct the history of what occurred there, which should be said that they were, I think, already aware of the fact that the Holocaust, like any genocide, was not only about killing people, it was also about erasing their memory. It was about doing something and then making it disappear, erasing the entire undertaking. And so what they were doing were, was to try and save the memory of the event in all its nuance and details. And for me, uh, you know, um, Lauren mentioned that I published a book in 2007, Erase, which was about the erasure. And in this book, I tried to repopulate this town. And in a sense, I tried to bring it back to life. Uh, because all of that disappeared. None of this, there's no memory in Buchach. Adam asked about Buchach. In Buchach now, there are few attempts, uh, but they are still um, resisted by much of the population. Uh, the the, the pre-World War II history of Buchach is not taught in Buchach. Uh, they've now recognized that uh, Agnon, the author, came from there. So there's a little literary club there. But by and large, it resembles many other towns in this area where the memory of what had been there before and how it was destroyed has been completely erased. We have a question from Penny Buskila. Uh, what role did Agnon's stories play in your research and how, if at all, did they affect your mindset as a researcher of Bukash? So, you know, Agnon is an, an, an absolutely wonderful writer. Um, it, 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 it's highly recommended to read him in Hebrew uh, because translating Agnon is very difficult. Uh, and there are translations of some of his works, including now recently a translation of his, um, so to speak, biography of Guchach, which uh, was published posthumously. Uh, but it's only a partial translation and it's not as good as the original. 
uh, I was very influenced by Agnon, um, and, and I was influenced in, in various ways by Agnon. I would say that Agnon wrote about Buchach as a Jew. So for him, Buchach was a Jewish town. He hardly has anybody else there. There's maybe one, uh, one Pototsky there, one uh, of the, the Count Pototsky. There are few Gentiles, but by and large, it's a story of a Jewish town. And in that, he resembles uh, how Poles remember that town and write about it. There's a Polish town and Ukrainians talk about it. There's a Ukrainian town. But what he did in his writing, and he says that in uh, when he was writing his biography of Buchach in the last 20 years of his life, and he was asked by a famous literary critic, Agnon, why, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a city. So in his writing, he was trying to rebuild the Buchach, the Jewish Buchach that had been eradicated, and which for him represented the entire universe of small town uh, Jewish towns in Eastern Europe, an entire civilization that was um, erased. Now, I should say that uh, I use Buchach in Agnon in this book. I used him much more in the book that I just finished. So I'm, I'm completely absorbed with Agnon now because the stories he tells are the stories of Buchach before the war. He doesn't talk about what happened in the Holocaust. He was not there. And it, for him, it's something that he he cannot write about. So he writes about the world that existed before, before there was all this killing. And, and, and that is well worth reading because it really brings you into that world that was erased and forgotten. Um, we have a question from Mario. Good evening, Dr. Bartok. You mentioned earlier that victims of genocide are viewed as byproducts of genocide. Have historians or societies in general failed uh, to tell, sorry, to humanize victims of genocide to better tell their stories with hopes to reconcile, or is it simply easier to forget and move on? Well, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I don't think that I'm the only one who has uh, uh, tried to do what I try to do. Uh, but I think that within the historiography of the Holocaust, you can say that in the first decades of Holocaust uh, scholarship, uh, for a variety of reasons, there was more focus on the perpetrators. And as a result of that, um, there was not much focus on the victims. And they appeared, as I said, through the eyes of the perpetrators as a sort of product of, of what they were trying to do. There was another scholarship that was happening largely in Israel, largely produced in Yad Vashem by the so-called Jerusalem School of Historians, which was very much about Jewish communities. And it did tell the story uh, of victims. It largely wanted to tell the story of the resistors that was part of the sort of Zionist uh, plot of the Holocaust. And increasingly, it also told the story of communities. But it was not seen really as uh, mainstream Holocaust historiography. It was Jewish history. And what was seen as mainstream Holocaust historiography was the kind of works from Hilberg on, which were works on how organized, how genocide was organized. Now that has happened with a number of other genocides where you have sort of collections of testimonies on the one hand, and you have histories that give you the narrative of the genocide told from through the eyes of the perpetrators or through the documents of the perpetrators. And I do believe that we can, we, we need to seek a different way of speaking about it uh, and to um, somehow overcome the sort of mechanical way of looking at genocide because ultimately Genocide is about one person killing another person, but a mass. It is ultimately th through that that we understand what it is. And when we miss that, when we don't think about that, and we tend not to because it's so hard to do. And because as we know, in most cases, in most genocide, people get away with murder. Most people who perpetrated genocide were not brought to justice. Um, in order to, to understand how important it is, we have to look at it through uh, 
from below. We have to see it as it happens on the ground. We have to understand what it does to an entire society. So in that sense, yes, I think there's still a great deal of work to be done. Um, so Omar, earlier when you were talking about the chapters that you <laughs> were, I knew it, and I bet Lauren knew it too, that you were going to say, well, there's another book. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and I just put them in there because I don't even want to know how many at this point there are. <laughs> but um, so the question is from Sarah Walshaw, what's next? Uh, where did this research and book take you? You know. Mm -hmm. what, What's the next uh, project? This will be our last, our last question. Well, uh, so, so I mentioned the book that I just finished. I'm still, you know, um, but it's done. It's done. Um, and it's, um, it, I really enjoyed it, actually. It was a lot of fun. I mean, a lot of it was written already uh, because these were drafts, but I spent the summer, you know, ensconced in my study because we can't go anywhere. So I couldn't escape from it. And every day I worked on it. And... Um, it is, it's, it's a fun book and it, and it ends with a long chapter, which is the actual, the entire conversation that I had with my mother. So, so it is about what I call making and unmaking the past. Um, and the next book that I want to do, which I'm now thinking about, and I hope to be able to do, I want to call remaking the past, uh, a personal political history. And it would be a book about it would be in sort of transition from my talking with my mother and how she came to Palestine and had to change into a different person and not just her, but an entire group of people who left those places just before and then remade themselves. Uh, it moves to basically the first generation born in Israel. So it's my generation. And what interests me most about that is how my generation, which was taught to look only forward, as I said, there was no past. The past was the diaspora. We were sp supposed to negate the diaspora. This was Shlilata Gola, negation of the diaspora. How we came to understand two things over time. One was that we did not come from nothing. It was that we came from over there and that we had to understand that, that we had to know that world because otherwise our who we were was very flat. It started just when we were born. And there were things that happened before that. The second, which my generation is still working on, is something else. Because that came when we were in our 40s, that sort of realization. But the second was that the place we were born into had just itself undergone something. We were born right after the War of 1948 and the expulsion of the Palestinians. We, I as a child, played in so-called abandoned Palestinian villages. And that realization that we were born after another erasure uh, is something that members of my generation well into their 60s by now are still working on. And so for me, this would be my next project to try and understand how we came to view those two paths that just occurred before our very birth. I'm going to jump in here and say uh, thank you so much, Professor Bartov. Thank you to Professor Panchassi and Professor Rossi for handling the questions uh, and the conversation so well. I get, it's amazing to have, I feel like we're sitting across the table from each other. In fact, the proximity of the screen is, is quite wonderful in, in helping me to understand what you're conveying in this inspirational talk. And my only regret now is this would be the time when everybody would give you a big round of applause to thank you. Uh, for your insights, and you can't quite hear it the same way that you would uh, if you were here in Vancouver. So next time, uh, we hope to have you join us in Vancouver as, as, uh, as soon as we can do it. But imagine the applause and imagine the warm feelings coming Thank across. You. This one. Thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, now announce our upcoming event, uh, which will be at 6 p.m. on Thursday, November 5th. This will be another webinar lecture featuring Mariette Rosen, Doduck in conversation with Professor Rossi. You can see the title here, and you'll be able to sign up for it the same way that you signed up for this event. And I apologize, there were actually more questions than we were able to answer, more questions than Professor Bartov was able to answer. If you want to revisit this, we will be posting a recording of this lecture uh, at the SFU History website.
And uh, once again, I will say, please join me in thanking Professor Bartov for his wonderful talk. And have a great night.